Thank you for watching Scary Animal Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the deepest, darkest jungles of the heart of Africa. In the tropical jungle of Sierra Leone, the canopy is draped over rugged mountains. Plant and animal diversity is so rich here that it would take multiple pages to list the different species. This area receives an average of about one-third of an inch of rainfall each day, and temperatures rarely get above the mid-80s, but the humidity is always very high. Plants grow quickly and food is abundant in this environment. On April 23rd of 2006, American subcontractors are working on completing the American Embassy nearby when they are offered the chance to visit the Takagama Chimpanzee Refuge. This is an exciting proposal to the men. Alan Robertson, Gary Brown, and Richie Goody follow their local friend and guide Melvin Mama and hail a taxi. As the group drives down the country road leading to the refuge, they admire the jungle as it blurs by and they feel exuberant. Taxi cab driver Isak Anu knows the route well, even though the road is not maintained. As the vehicle turns onto the road that goes up the hill to the refuge, the men are in for quite a surprise. Unbeknownst to them, the chimpanzees at the refuge have been observing the keepers at the refuge, in particularly the way they open and close the gates to the cages. The chimps have watched and seen the process completely closely enough that they know how now to open the doors and gates themselves. A short time before the contractors decided to visit, the chimps escaped and have now overwhelmed the gates and personnel of the refuge. There are now 31 chimps surrounding the refuge and they are not happy. Some of these chimps have seen their parents killed or been forced to participate in psychological or medical research and have not developed a favorable opinion of people in general. They are not about to return to their enclosures, even though the refuge was the place they were protected from their prior traumas. The biggest chimp in the refuge was a giant male by the name of Bruno. To be fair, Bruno had not had the easiest of lives. In 1989, 150 miles north of the national capital, Freetown, Bala and Sharmila Amarasakaran were visiting a market. There was a sick adolescent chimp being offered there for sale, and the Amarasakarans purchased it for $30 and brought it home. They soon purchased a second chimpanzee and named her Julie. The chimps were obviously not fit for living in a human dwelling, and soon they were so strong and big that it was decided to construct a refuge for them and other orphaned chimps. Within two years, the refuge housed 24 chimps after a land grant from the government. The sick young male that was initially purchased for $30 was now a 270-pound behemoth of a male and the clear leader of his very own family troop. His name was Bruno. As the subcontractors approached the refuge, they could see movement in the trees just off the road leading up the hill. Bruno was the alpha male of the troop, which meant he not only conducted the politics of garnering the political support of the elders of the troop, but he was also their chief defender. In chimpanzee troops, it isn't necessarily the largest and most violent male who leads the troop, as the elders are the ones who elect the alpha, if you will. Chimpanzee society is very complex, and males pass their prime, as well as what we would consider the moms and the grandmas of chimpanzee society, watch the younger, more powerful males who are vying for alpha male position among the troop. The candidates are expected to take care of everyone, and might bring an older female food or play with their child. Even if an exceptionally powerful male beats up, kills, or intimidates all of his rivals into submission, the elders of the chimp society may not support him if they do not like him. Bruno is a unanimous favorite. Bruno watches the vehicle containing the four men approach up the road and immediately drops from the canopy of the jungle and onto the road in front of the car. As the Americans in the vehicle dig for cameras, as they believe they're seeing a gorilla, cab driver Issa puts the car in reverse and immediately begins backing down the road. As a native of the area, Issa and Melvin both know the power a chimpanzee possesses. It is said that a male chimp the size of Bruno would be ten times stronger than a heavyweight boxer. As the car and its occupants retreat down the road backwards, they see Bruno's immense muscles ripple as he begins to advance to attack their car. Bruno's impressive musculature is not for looks, and serves him well as he easily overtakes the reversing car. As Bruno runs alongside the cab driver's window, he reaches out and rips the mirror off with nearly no effort. Bruno discards the side mirror and continues along the side of the car. Bruno explodes through the rear driver's side window and into the back seat of the car. He's moving so quickly that he's a black blur of screaming and biting. 
Bruno focuses his anger on Melvin in the back seat when Issa puts the car in forward gear and hits the accelerator. The car lurches to a stop and peels out as it changes directions. The shift in momentum causes Bruno to fall back out the rear window, but somehow Melvin is pulled out with him. As his friends grab him to keep him from being pulled from the car, they see Bruno alongside the vehicle with the better part of Melvin's hand in his mouth. Melvin finally shakes the giant alpha from his hand and loses about half of his palm and three of his fingers in the process. The men see the car advancing up the road through the cracked windshield. Gary Brown takes his shirt off and wraps it around the remaining portion of Melvin's hand. As the car speeds up, the gates to the refuge ahead are closing. Issa decides they must make the gate to be protected from the chimps and accelerates up the hill. The other men in the vehicle try to get him to stop, but the car collides with the gates violently, temporarily knocking out some of the men. The car is just inside the gates now, and Bruno and his troop are beginning to surround and approach the vehicle. Brown comes to his senses after other occupants have left the car, and they are now on the outside of the gates, while Melvin and Gary are still inside the gates. Gary can hear Melvin outside crying for help, and he immediately feels rage ignite inside of him as he exits the vehicle. He sees Bruno standing over Melvin and begins to yell at him. Bruno takes this as an obvious challenge and stands to his feet and charges Gary. As he charges, Bruno's head throws back and forth as he screams and yells in rage. He holds his arms above his head as he approaches Gary in an attempt to intimidate him. As Gary stepped out of the vehicle just moments earlier, he grabbed a big tree branch with a fork in the end of it from the side of the road. Gary brandished it for his defense and steeled himself for the fight against Bruno as the chimp screamed in rage during his approach. Gary's an average-sized man around 5 feet 9 inches tall and weighs about 205 pounds, and he feels dwarfed by the 6 foot tall and much larger alpha male chimp. Gary yells in answer to Bruno's screams and the two aggressively close the distance for combat. As Bruno charges, he lifts his head and chin high while screaming that gives Gary an excellent target for his forked branch. As the two run toward each other, Gary jabs that forked end of the branch right into Bruno's throat, which lifts the giant chimp up off the ground and slams him onto his back. Gary flips the branch around and begins ramming the blunt end into Bruno's muscle-bound body. Over and over, he strikes Bruno, and suddenly the chimp is gone. He rolls from under Gary and meekly slinks into the forest, pursued by Gary. As soon as the pair hit the jungle, Gary stops chasing Bruno. The giant alpha chimp has been humiliated by Gary in his own eyes and exhibits submissive behavior to Gary. Bruno averts his eyes and turns his back in a non-confrontational show of supplication. The jungle goes crazy with the troop witnessing the fall of their champion in such dramatic fashion. Gary finds the other two Americans and instructs them to run down the road and get help. He asks them where Issa went and they tell him he climbed the fence moments ago and had already run down the road. The two Americans hesitantly run down the road to get help, as directed by Gary. He then turns his attention to Melvin and begins assessing his wounds. Not only is most of Melvin's hand missing now, but his foot is completely shredded. While Gary was exiting the vehicle, Bruno was crushing Melvin's foot in his mouth and ripping it with his hands. It is now a mangled mass of sagging tendons and flesh. There is no longer an appearance of a foot there at all. Gary and Melvin have a brief conversation about what to do next, and resolve to stay together. Gary wraps his arm around Melvin's back and puts his shoulder under Melvin's, and the two limp down the road together. Gary can hear the chimps surrounding them in the trees, yelling and screaming. They're not emerging from the canopy, but are raucous and loud with excitement. Gary looks around to where he left Bruno, and the massive chimp is still sulking by himself right where Gary left him. A short distance down the road, Gary and Melvin see an army vehicle approaching them. The two men who left were successful in finding help. The soldiers help load Melvin into the back of the military truck and they speed toward the nearest hospital. As Melvin is getting medical help, a car pulls up and Gary sees a deformed mass of humanity in the trunk. The man's jaw has been torn from his face. Both hands and both feet have been torn or bitten from his body. His genitals have been bitten or torn off and he has been disemboweled. Gary asks the male nurse what happened to this guy and is shaken by the response. The man says, this is Issa, Gary. The chimps had pursued him as he fled down the road and savaged him upon catching him. Had he fought like Gary, perhaps he may have lived. Of the 31 escaped chimpanzees, 27 returned, but Bruno was one of the four that did not. He and his small band of loyal friends melted into the forest. In the early 1970s, there were estimated to be 20,000 chimps in Sierra Leone and today there are thought to be about 5,000. 
Today, the Takogama Chimpanzee Refuge provides sanctuary for 100 chimps. The refuge has placed cameras in the jungle and is believed to have caught pictures of Bruno living with wild chimps in the area. He's had seven years, at least, to consider returning to the refuge the way the others did, and he's never tried. Melvin recovered from his injuries and was the only other person other than Issa to sustain serious injury. Gary Brown is still tortured by the screams and violence that he witnessed in the jungle of Sierra Leone. Thank you. Welcome back to Scary Animal Attacks. Today's episode takes us to western Pennsylvania. Not the mountains, though. To the Pittsburgh Zoo. To the African Painted Dog Exhibit, to be precise. This exhibit attracts thousands of onlookers who admire the coloration and athletic build of the wolves of the African savanna. Now, I know that these dogs are not wolves, but they are the closest thing that Sub-Saharan Africa has to a wolf. African painted dogs hunt in packs and pursue their prey for very long distances frequently. They also use strategies similar to a wolf pack. Their differences are that painted dogs are much smaller than wolves, and they have about one-fourth of the bite force in their jaws compared to wolves. One more interesting fact about African painted dogs is that they have never been known to kill a human being in the wild. Of all the animals in Africa, the painted dog has never been known to be hostile toward human children, elderly, weak, or single people in the bush country. At the Pittsburgh Zoo and Aquarium, the sleek forms of the painted dog exhibit have limited space. Consequently, they don't do the running they do in the wild. However, they do have a route of travel in the exhibit which they do tend to cover in a routine pattern. Many captive animals rock back and forth or pace across their enclosures and back to give themselves stimulation or break up their boredom. The dogs don't have to hunt for their food and there isn't any possibility of external packs vying for their hunting ground so they tend to wander about on their interior trail system. On November 4th, 2012, Jason and Elizabeth Durkosh and their two-year-old son Maddox were looking down into the painted dog exhibit and watching the dogs interact with each other. Their primary fence had a gap in it, which allowed people to lean over the exhibit to get a better look at the dogs, but doing so meant disregarding the clearly posted warning signs forbidding this. There was a safety net designed to catch items from falling into the pen, and the exhibit had passed all 35 safety inspections from the United States Department of Agriculture since it opened in 2006. There were some complaints from interior sources, though. On at least six occasions, zoo staff and volunteers had raised concerns about the possibility of a small child slipping through the opening and into the exhibit. In fact, on at least three different occasions, incidents of parents dangling their children by their arms into the exhibit or children dangling themselves over the edge were noted and reported on meeting notes. These incidents were reported months apart and never received serious consideration from a decision maker at the zoo. Elizabeth and Maddox were clearly oblivious to the staff concerns expressed during these meetings. Elizabeth and Maddox were admiring the beauty of the painted dogs together as she held him in her arms. As they approached the opening in the fence, Elizabeth held her young son up on the railing of the observation deck. Maddox lurched forward, causing her to lose her grip on him and sending him plummeting into the exhibit. He tumbled several feet before he landed on the safety net, intended to prevent similar catastrophes. The only problem was, instead of the net absorbing his energy, it sent him rebounding upward and down into the dog pen. It was designed to catch small items like a cell phone or sunglasses, not a young child. Maddox had fallen a combined 14 feet in the fall, but was conscious after he hit the ground. All 11 of the African painted dogs in the exhibit immediately swarmed him. They bit him about the head and neck ferociously. Elizabeth screamed for help and started to climb into the exhibit to save her baby, but onlookers restrained her. She could only watch while the dogs attacked her son. A nearby police officer ran over and shot one of the painted dogs in a vain attempt at rescue. The pack of dogs eviscerated poor Maddox, rupturing and piercing his organs. The dogs dismembered Maddox so quickly that there was nothing that could be done to save him. The veterinarian at the zoo indicated that employees should not risk harm by entering the enclosure to retrieve his body as little Maddox was clearly dead. The zoo staff eventually recovered his remains, which were sent to a coroner for analysis. The coroner's report indicated that there were 46 bite injuries on his head and neck alone. When asked for a comment on the situation, renowned animal expert and enthusiast Jack Hanna reported that African painted dogs were extremely aggressive in his interactions with them. 
He filmed many episodes of his television show in Africa and indicated that even if there were police officers present at the moment, there would have been nothing that would have saved Little Maddox from the dog's jaws. During the subsequent lawsuit that was filed by the Durkosh family, it became known that the dogs had escaped their enclosure at one point, sending the zoo into lockdown until they could be rounded back up. The dogs did not attack anyone at that time, nor did they act aggressively toward anyone. The zoo claimed that they had not received any complaints about children dangling off the rail into the exhibit, nor parents doing the same. They also said that they had a crisis plan in place to deal with scenarios like this. The lawsuit was settled for an undisclosed amount, and the African painted dog exhibit was replaced with a cheetah exhibit soon after this event. The questions I'm left with after this report is, why did the dogs behave so aggressively toward Maddox when they hadn't been aggressive toward people before? Was it territorial? Was it a sort of frustration derived from their captivity or the exhibit they had to occupy? Or do humans have their behavior all wrong? Is their behavior typical for a predator fighting for its survival? Are the dogs actually considered wild still, even while in a zoo? Should we expect them to behave differently than they would or might in the wild once they're in a zoo? The glaring irony of this story is that the wild dogs were not known to predate on humans at all in their natural environments, but the first ever human death attributed to their jaws occurred once they were exhibited in a zoo. Please post your comments below in the comments section and remember little Maddox and his family in your thoughts and Welcome back to Scary Animal Attacks. Today's episode takes us to a farm in northwest Tennessee, the county of Obion to be precise. Yes, this area is rural and remote, but we aren't discussing a wild animal in this episode, but one of the longest domesticated animals in human history. The Shirley Farm has a portion of it dedicated as a petting zoo called the Pumpkin Barn. In this little petting zoo, there are many smaller animals, but there is nothing small about the dromedary camels there. March 10th, 2022 was an interesting day on Shirley Farms in Obion, Tennessee. 42-year-old high school janitor Bobby Matheny and 67-year-old Tommy Gunn were visiting the petting zoo. They'd visited the goats and chickens and moved on to the various other animals at the petting zoo. And as they approached the camel and zebra pen, they looked around for the camel. They could see the small seep of water that bisected the pen and provided some kind of water for them, but no camel. As they rounded the corner of the metal gate, they could see a small group of people and a camel. The camel was out of its enclosure and seemed very excited. Some of the people thought that the camel was supposed to be walking around wherever it wanted, but unbeknownst to them, it had escaped its enclosure and was very unhappy. Let's review some pretty important details about camels that probably are not common knowledge. First of all, they're huge. They stand nearly 7 feet tall at their shoulder and can weigh up to 1,300 pounds. That's about the size of a moose. They can kick forward and backward equally well and are strong enough to kill just about any animal with their kick. The males have a rut season just like deer and elk, and they tend to get ill-tempered and impatient during this time. Camels are induced ovulators. That means that females release eggs after they are bred. This creates a somewhat variable breeding season that lasts through the winter months. Finally, camels have canine teeth. As Bobby and Tommy were helping some of the others round up the camel, it became aggressive. There were a few people helping round up the camel, but the two people that seemed to have caught the brunt of the animal's anger were these two men. Maybe the camel had a male keeper that it didn't particularly like and they resembled him somehow. Or maybe these men were unfamiliar with how to handle a large male camel in must. Regardless, the events that unfolded next would be frightful and saddening. As the small crowd of helpful volunteers tried to get the giant camel to cooperate, a camel axiom began to push its way into the ease of American life. Camels are extremely vengeful, and this camel had been left without fresh water for far too long. The small ditch meandering through its pen had fetid water in it. Camels like fresh water. Once a camel identifies an enemy, it takes a lot of making up to win the animal back. This camel had begun to identify humans as abusers, and in particularly men. As they tried to direct the camel back to its pen, it began kicking and biting Tommy and Bobby. When a camel bites you, it can fit your entire head between its jaws, and that's what it did. It repeatedly bit each of the men and put as much of their bodies in its mouth with each bite, crushing their necks, arms, and legs. This camel was so upset and so angry that it stomped and kicked the men's bodies until police arrived at the location. When the sheriffs began devising a plan to recover the men's bodies, as they were apparently dead, the camel attacked their car. 
had tried to bite and kicked the police cruiser in an attempt to get the deputies to back off. Due to the danger presented by the violence of the animal, the police shot it and killed it. They then recovered Tommy and Bobby's bodies and began an investigation into this event. The U.S. Department of Agriculture inspected the petting zoo in 2019 and noted that there was no barrier between people and the camels at the time. They had also noted an absence of attendees or employees to watch over things. My question is, did either of these men or the zoo owners investigate the potential for violence or harm from a camel? In other attacks noted prior to this event, an Indian man tied his camel up during the heat of the day and tied up its legs as well. When he returned to the camel, it bit him by his neck and threw his body onto the ground. It tore his head off, then nibbled and bit his corpse. It took several hours for the man's neighbors to calm his camel down and recover his body. In another attack in Texas prior to this event, two men were killed in a similar fashion at a camel breeding operation by a male in must during breeding season. Camels have been domesticated, if you want to call it that, for around 6,000 years. Known to be ill-tempered at times, people have weighed the risks versus the rewards as they were once the preferred way to navigate the deserts of the world.